Hello and welcome to this second look exploring session and today we are completing our second look of uh, the true tragedy of Richard III from the repertoire of the Queen's Men. We have got up to uh, just uh, about 10 scenes or so in, depending on how you count the scenes. Uh, it could say we're 11 scenes in if you count it a different way. Um, and we have reached a point where uh, Richard has, has managed to get, uh, get on the throne and uh, is starting to deal with, uh, one foot in the throne anyway, and deal with his enemies and one of them uh, is uh, putatively uh, Jane Shaw who we're going to reintroduce uh, ourselves to in a moment and the play is going to rattle through and for those who have just joined us from the first uh, 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 session of this second look um, I'm not going to talk for much longer uh, so that you can get straight back into the action. We have a wonderful uh, group of people reading here today uh, remember this is uh, just a second look we haven't really rehearsed anything uh, a couple of little bits We've spent a, a few minutes uh, vaguely sorting out, but uh, otherwise this is very much sight reading uh, from uh, a, a mixture of skill sets and people from around the world. And this is basically a bit of fun for the end of the week to help us primarily to understand how the play flows and uh, how it moves uh, forward. So uh, this isn't a full uh, deluxe, super deluxe show, but it is a step closer. It is the idea of what a show might look like. Uh, in the room today, reading, if you want to find out who they are, uh, in more detail and the parts that they are reading it is in the show notes but we have in the room today Stephen, Francis, Tamara, Eric, Lois, Lisa, uh, Liza, Alan, Alexandra, Elizabeth, Emma, Sarah, Dan, Lynn, Helen, Aliki, Valentina and I am your host Robert and uh, without further ado I'm going to ask all of the lovely readers to vacate the space as we prepare ourselves and get ourselves ready to go. So this is the second half of the true tragedy of Richard III. Shaw's wife, dishonour to the king, a shame to thy country, and the only blot of defame to all thy kindred. Die. Why was I made fair that a king should favour me? But my friends should have preferred discipline before affection, for they knew of my folly, yea. My own husband knew of my breach of disloyalty and yet suffered me by reason he knew it bootless to kick against the brig. Oh, sweet King Edward, little didst thou think Shaw's wife should have been so hardly used. Thy unnatural brother, not content with my goods, which are yet confiscate in his custody, but yet more to add to my present misery, hath proclaimed upon great penalty that none whatsoever shall either aid or succour me. But here, being comfortless, to die in the streets with hunger, I am constrained to beg, but I fear it is in vain, for none will pity me. Yet, here come one to whom I have done good in restoring his lands that were lost. Now, will I try him to see if he will give me anything? Our time, how thou sufferest fortune to alter estates and changest the minds of the good for the worse. How many headless peers sleep in their graves, whose places are furnished with their inferiors, such as are neither nobly born nor virtuously minded. My heart hardly bewails the loss of the young king by the outrage of the protector, who hath proclaimed himself king by the name of Richard III. The commons murmur at it greatly that the young king and his brother should be imprisoned, but to what end is hard to say. 
but many think they shall never come forth again. But God do all for the best, that the right heirs may not be utterly overthrown. Oh, gods, what a grief is it for me to ask where I have given. Ah, oh, my good Lord Hastings, how innocently thou did the heavens bear witness. Good sir, take pity on me and relieve me. Indeed, tis pity to see so fair a face to ask for arms. But tell me, hast thou no friends? Yes, sir, I had many friends. But when my chiefest friend of all died, the rest then forsook me. Belike then thy fact was notorious, that thy friends leaving thee would let thee go as a spoil for villains. But hearest thou, I prithee, tell me the truth, and as I am a gentleman, I will pity thee. Oh, Lodowick, tell thee the truth. Why, have this entreaty served thee, when thy lands had been clean gone, had it not been for Shaw's wife? Dost thou make me so long to beg for a little? Indeed, my lands I had restored me by Mistress Shaw. But may this be she? Why, Lodowick, I am she that begged thy lands of King Edward the Fourth. Therefore, I pray thee, bestow something on me. Oh, gods, what is this world, and how uncertain are riches? Is this she that was in such credit with the king? Nay more, that could command the king indeed. I cannot deny, but my land she restored me. But shall I by relieving of her hurt myself? No, for straight proclamation is made that none shall succour her. Therefore, for fear I should be seen talk with her, I will shun her company and get me to my chamber and there set down in heroical verse the shameful end of a king's concubine, which is no doubt as wonderful as the defoliation of a kingdom. Oh, Lodowick, if thou wilt give me nothing yet, stay and talk with me. Oh, no. He shuns my company. All my friends now forsake me. In prosperity I had many, but in adversity, <laughs> none. Oh, gods, have I this for my good I have done? For when I was in my chiefest pomp, I thought that day well spent wherein I might pleasure my friend by suits to the king. For if I had spoken, he would not have said nay. For though he was king, yet Shaw's wife swayed the sword. Aye. Where need was, there was I bountiful, and mindful I was still upon the poor to relieve them. And now none will know me, nor succour me. Therefore, here shall I die for want of sustenance. Yet, here come another whom I have done good into, in saving the life of his son. Well, I will try him to see if he will give me anything. No men, no laws, no princes, no orders. All has hushed, neighbor. Now he's king, but before he was king, how was the team swacked with ruffians? What phrase had we in the streets? Now he hath proclaimed peace between Scotland and England for six years, to what end I know not. Usurpers had need to be wise. Ah, oh, good sir, relieve me and bestow something upon me. Ah, neighbor, hedges have e eyes and highways have ears, but who is a beggar woman? The streets are full of them in faith. But here's thou, hast thou no friends that thou goest a begging so? Yes, sir, I had friends, but they are all dead as you are. Why am I dead, neighbor? I, why, thou arrant queen, what means thou by that? I mean they are dead in charity. But I pray, sir, had not you the life of your son saved in the time of King Edward the Fourth by one Shaw's wife? Uh, yes, marry had I, but art thou a sprig of the same bough? I promise you, neighbour, I thought so, that so idle a housewife could not be without the acquaintance of so noble a strumpet. Well, for her sake, I'll give thee something somewhat. 
nay, then know that I am she that saved the life of thy condemned son. Who art thou? Sure's uh, wife? Lie still, purse. Neighbor, I would not for 20 pounds have given her one farthing. The proclamation is so hard by King Richard. Why, minion, art thou she that was the dishonor to the king? The shame to her husband, the discredit to her city. Here you lay your fingers to work and get thereby somewhat to maintain you. Oh, neighbor, I grow very choleric. And thou didst save this life of my son. Why, if thou hadst not another would, and for my part, I would have been, he, I would have, I would he had been hanged seven years ago. It had saved me a great deal of money then. But come, let us go in and let the queen alone. Thus, thus am I might become an open shame to the world. Here shall I die in the streets for want of sustenance? Alas, is my fact so heinous that none will pity me? Yet here come another to whom I have done good, who is least able to pleasure me. Yet I will try him to see if he will give me anything. Now, sir. Who but King Richard bears sway and hath proclaimed John Earl of Lincoln heir apparent to the crown? The young princes, they are in the tower. Nay, yeah, some says more, they are murdered. But this makes me to muse. The Duke of Buckingham and the king is at such variance that did all in all to help him to the crown. But the Duke of Buckingham is rid down to Brecknock Castle in Wales. And there he means to raise up a power to pull down the usurper. But let them agree as they will. For the next fair wind, I'll overseas. Ah, oh, Shaw's wife, so near driven to beg of a serving man. Why, necessity hath no law, I must needs. Good sir, relieve me and give me something. Why, what art thou? In brief, Morton, I am Shaw's wife that have done good to all. A fool and ever thine own enemy. In truth, Mistress Shore, my store is but small, yet as it is, we'll part stakes. But soft, I cannot do what I would. I am watched. Good Morton, relieve me. What should I relieve my king's enemy? Why, thy promise thou wouldst. I tell thee, I will not, and so be answered. Soon as I would with all my heart, but for yonder villain, a plague on him. An honest fellow, I warrant him. How now, Shore's wife? Will none relieve thee? No. None will relieve her that hast been good to all. Why, twere pity to do thee good. Ugh, but methinks she is fulsome and stinks. Oh. If I be fulsome, shun my company, for none but thy lord sought my misery, and he hath undone me. Why, hath he undone thee? Nay, thy wicked and naughty life hath undone thee. But if thou wantest maintenance, why dost thou not fall to thine old trade again? Nay, villain, I have done open penance, and am sorry for my sins that are past. Zoons, is Shore's wife become an holy whore? <laughs> Nay, then, we shall never have done. Why, hang thee! If thy faults were so written in thy forehead as mine is, it would be as wrong with thee. But I prithee, leave me, and get thee from me. And cannot you keep the city, but you must run gadding to the court? And you stay here a little longer, I'll make you be set away. For my part, would all whores were so served, and then there'd be fewer in England than there be. And so farewell, good mistress Shore. And all such usurping kings as thy lord is may come to a shameful end, which no doubt I may yet live to see. Therefore, sweet God, forgive all my foul offenses. And though I have done wickedly in this world, into hell fire, let not my soul be hurled. Master Tyrrell, the king hath written that for one night I should deliver you the keys and put you in full possession. But, good Master Tyrrell, may I be so bold to demand a question without offence? 
Health, God forbid. Say on, whate'er it be. Then this, Master Tyrrell, for your coming I partly know the cause, for the king oftentimes hath sent to me to have them both uh, dispatched. But because I was servant to their father, being Edward the Fourth, my heart would never give me to do the deed. Why, Sir Robert, you are beside the matter. What need you, you such speeches? What matters are between the king and me? I pray you leave it and deliver me the keys. <sighs> Here with tears I deliver you the keys. And so, farewell, Master Tyrrell. Alas, good Sir Robert. He is kind-hearted, but it must not prevail. What I have promised the king, I must perform. But ho, Miles Forrest. Here, sir. Miles Forrest, have you got those men I spake of? They must be resolute and pitiless. I warrant you, sir, they are such pitiless villains that all London cannot match them for their villainy. One of them, their names is Will Slaughter, yet for the most part they call him Black Will. The other is Jack Denton, two murderous villains that are resolute. I pray thee, call them in that I may see them and speak with them. Ho, Will, and Jack. Yes, sir, we're at hand. Uh, these be they that I told you of. Come hither, sirs. To make a long discourse were but a folly. You seem to be resolute in this cause that Miles Foster hath delivered to you. Therefore, you must cast away pity and not so much as think upon favour. For the more stern that you are, the more you shall please the king. Sound, sir. Now talk to us of favour. It is not the first that Jack and I have gone about. Well said. But the king's pleasure is this, that he will have no blood shed in the deed doing. Therefore, let me hear your advices. Why then, I think this, Master Tyrrell, that as they sit at supper, there should be two dags ready charged, and so suddenly to shoot them both through. No, I like that not so well. What says thou, Will? What is thy opinion? Tush, here's more ado than needs. I pray, bring me where they are, and I'll take them by the heels and beat their brains against the walls. Nay, I like not that, for it is too tyrannous. Then hear me, Master Tyrrell. Let Will take one, and I'll take the other, and by the life of Jack Denton, we'll cut <coughs> both their throats. Nay, sirs, then hear me. I will have it done in this order. When they both be a bed and at rest, Miles Forest, thou shalt bring them up both, and between two feather beds smother them both. Why, this is very good. Uh, but stand aside, here come the princes. I'll bring you word when the deed is done. How fares my noble lord and loving brother? Ah, oh, worthy brother, Richard, the Duke of York. My cause of sorrow is not for myself, but this is, this is it that adds my sorrow more. To see our uncle, whom our father left as our protector in minority, should so digress from duty, love, and zeal, so unkindly thus to keep us prisoners, and know no sufficient cause for it. Why, brother, comfort yourself, for though he detain us a while, he will not keep us long, but at last he will send us to our loving mother again. Whether it please God to send us, I doubt not, but our mother would keep us so safe that all the prelates in the world should not deprive her of us again. So much I assure myself of. But here comes Miles Forrest. I prithee, Miles, tell my kingly brother some merry story to pass away the time, for thou seest he is melancholy. No, Miles, tell me no merry story, but answer me to one question. What was he that walked with thee in the garden? Methought he had the keys. My lord, it was one that was appointed by the king to be an aide to Sir Thomas Brackenbury. Did the king? Well, Miles Forrest, am not I king? Oh, I would have said, my lord, your uncle, uh, the protector. Nay, my kingly uncle, I know he is now. But let him enjoy both crown and kingdom, so my brother and I may but enjoy our lives and liberty. But tell me. Is Sir Robert Brackenbury clean discharged? 
Oh, no, my lord, he hath but charged for a night or two. Nay, then, new officers, new laws. Would he had kept the old still? But who are they whose ghastly looks doth present a dying fear to my living body? A prithee, tell me, Miles, what are they? One, my lord, is called Jack Denton. The other is called Will Slaughter. But why starts your grace? Slaughter? I pray God it comes not to slaughter my brother and me, for from murder and slaughter, good Lord, deliver us. But tell me, Miles, is our lodging prepared? Aye, my lord, if it please your, br your brother and you to walk up. Then come, brother, we will go to bed. I will attend upon your grace. Come, Miles Forrest, bear us company. Sirs. Stay you two here, and when they are asleep, I'll call you up. I promise thee, Will, it grieves me to see what moan these young princes make. I'd rather than 40 pounds I ne'er taken it in hand. Tis a dangerous matter to kill innocent princes. I like you not. Why, you base slave, are you faint-hearted? A little thing would make me strike thee, I promise thee. Nay, go forward, for now I am re resolute. But come, let's to it. I pray thee stay, he'll call us up anon. But, Sirrah Jack, didst thou mark how the king started when he heard my name? What will he do when he feels me? But ho, sirs, come softly, for now they are at rest. Come, we are ready. By the mass, they are asleep indeed. I hear they sleep. And sleep, sweet princes, never wake no more, for you have seen the last light in this world. Come, press them down. It boots not to cry again, Jack. Upon them so lustily. But Master Forrest, Master Forrest, where shall we put the bodies? Why, go and bury them at the heap of stones at the stair foot while I go tell Master Tyrrell that the deed is done. Well, we will. Farewell, Master Forrest. How now, Miles Forrest? Is this deed dispatched? Aye, sir, a bloody deed we have performed. But tell me, what hast thou done with them? I have conveyed them to the stairs foot among a heap of stones, and anon I'll carry them where they shall be no more found again, nor all the chronicles shall never make mention what shall become of them. Yet, uh, good Master Tyrrell, Tell the king my name, that he may but reward me with a kingly thanks. I will go certify the king with speed. The Miles Forest, Will Slaughter, and Jack Denton, they three have done the deed. And so, farewell. <sighs> Good, my lord. Save my life. Ah, <laughs> villain. How canst thou ask for mercy when thou hast so unjustly betrayed me? I desire your grace, but give me leave to speak. I speak thy last villain, that those that hear it may see how unjustly thou hast betrayed me. Then thus, my lord, first, the proclamation was death to him that harboured your grace. I, 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 ah, villain, I and a thousand crowns to him that would betray me. Ah, my lord. My obedience to my prince is more. Oh, villain, thou betrayedst me for lucre and not for duty to thy prince. Why, Bannister, a good servant thinks his life well spent that spends it in the quarrel of his master. But villain, make thyself ready and here receive thy death. Henry, Duke of Buckingham. I arrest thee in King Richard's name as a traitor. Well, Herald, 
I will obey thy arrest. But am I arrested in King Richard's name? Usurping Richard? That insatiate bloodsucker, that traitor to God and man. Ha, <laughs> Richard, did I in Guildhall plead the orator for thee, and held thee in all thy sly and wicked practices, and for my reward dost thou allot me death? Buckingham, thou pledged thy part, and made him king, and put the lawful heirs beside. Why then is Buckingham guilty now of his death? Yet had not the Bishop of Ely fled, I had escaped. Come, the Duke of Buckingham shall not die. We will uh, take him away by force. Why, villains, will you be traitors to your prince? Nay, good my friends, give me leave to speak, and let me entreat you to lay your weapons by. And know this, countrymen, the cause I am arrested, this is, for bringing in your lawful king, which is Henry, Earl of Richmond, now in Brittany, and may in means ere long to land at Milford Haven in Wales, where I do know he shall have aid of the chiefest of the Welsh. He is your lawful king. And this a wrongful usurper, when you shall hear of him landed in that place, then take your weapons up and amain to him. He is the man must reave you of this yoke and send the usurper headless to his home. And poor Buckingham prays upon his knees to bless good Richmond in his enterprise, and when the conquest shall be given to him, grant he may match with Lady Elizabeth, as promise hath to four by him been passed. Why then, my friends, leave me along to death, and let me take this punishment in peace. <sighs> Buckingham, was not thy meaning good in displacing the usurper to raise a lawful king? <laughs> Buckingham, it was too late! The lawful heirs were smothered in the tower. Sweet Edward, and thy brother, I ne'er slept quiet thinking of your death. But vaunt, Buckingham! And thou wast altogether innocent of their deaths. But thou, villain, who of a child I nursed thee up, and hast so unjustly betrayed thy lord, let the curse of Buckingham ne'er depart from thee. Let vengeance, mischiefs, tortures light on thee and thine, and after death thou mayst more torture feel than when Ixion turns the restless wheel and ban thy soul where'er thou seest to rest. But come, my friends, let me away. My lord, we are sorry, but come, lay hands on Bannister. The goal is got! <laughs> the golden crown is won! And well deservest thou to wear the same that ventured hast thy body and thy soul. But what boots Richard now the diadem or kingdom got by murder of his friends. My fearful shadow that still followed me hath summoned me before the severe judge. My conscience, witness of the blood I spilt, accuseth me as guilty of the fact. The fact a damned judgment craves, whereas impartial justice hath condemned Methinks the crown which I before did wear, enchased with pearl and costly diamonds, is turned now into a fatal wreath of fiery flames and ever-burning stars. 
and raging fiends hath cast their ugly shapes in studious lakes addressed to tend on me. If it be thus, what wilt thou do in this extremity? Nay, what canst thou do to purge thee of thy guilt? Even repent, crave mercy for thy damned fact. Appeal for mercy to thy righteous God. Ha! Repent! Not I. Crave mercy they that list. My God is none of mine. Then, Richard, be thus resolved to pace thy soul in valence with their blood, soul for soul, and body for body. Yea, marry, <laughs> Richard, that's good. Catesby? Uh, you called, my lord, I think. It may be so. But what thinkst thou, Catesby? Uh, of what, my lord? Why, of all these troubles. Why, my lord, I hope to see them happily overcome. How, villain, dost thou hope to see me happily overcome? Who, you, my lord? My villain, thou points at me. <laughs> thou hopes to see me overcome? Uh, no, my good lord, your enemies, or or else not. <laughs> good, Catesby. <laughs> but what hearest thou of uh, of the Duke of Buckingham? <sighs> Why, he is dead, my lord. Uh, he was executed at Salisbury yesterday. Why, it is impossible. His friends hopes that he shall outlive me to be my head. <laughs> outlive you, my lord. That's strange. <laughs> No, Gatesby, if I do, it must be in fames, and since they hope he shall outlive me to be my head. He hops <laughs> without his head and rests among his fellow rebels. <laughs> Marry, no force, my lord. But, uh, Gatesby, what hearest thou of Henry, Earl of Richmond? Oh, not a word, my lord. No? Hearest thou not? He lives in Brittany in favor with the Duke. Nay more, Lady Margaret, his mother, conspires against us and persuades him that he is lineally descended from Henry the Fourth and that he hath a right to the crown. Therefore, tell me what thinkst thou of the Earl? Ah, uh, my lord, I think of the earl as he doth deserve. A Villain, dost thou praise my foe and commend him to my face? <laughs> Nay, my lord, I wish he were as good a friend as he is a foe, else uh, the due deserts of a traitor. What's that? Why, my lord, to lose his head? Yea, marry, I would twirl off quickly then. But more to the strengthening of his title, she goes about to marry him to the queen's eldest daughter, Lady Elizabeth. Uh, indeed, my lord, that I heard was concluded by all the nobility of Brittany. Why then, there it goes. <laughs> the great devil of hell go with all. A marriage begun in mischief shall end in blood. I think. That accursed sorceress, the mother queen, doth nothing but bewitch me, and hatcheth conspiracies, and, and brings out perilous birds to wound their country's weal. The, the earl is up in arms, and, and with him many of the nobility. He hath aid in France. He is rescued in Brittany, and never shortly to arrive in England. All this spites me not so much as his escape from Landau, the Duke's treasurer, who, if he had been pricked forth for revenge, had ended all by apprehending of our foe. But now he is in disgrace with the Duke, and we farther off our purpose than tofore. But the Earl hath not so many biting dogs abroad as we have sleeping curs. 
ready for rescue. Uh, but, uh, my lord, I, I marvel how he should get aid there, uh, considering he is no friend to Brittany. I so may marvel how the Duke of Brittany durst wake such a foe as England against him. What evil fares makes open wars. But who comes there, Catesby? Um, One of our spurs to revenge, the Lord Stanley, father-in-law to Lady Margaret. His coming is to us, Catesby. Were it not that his life might serve for apprehension against our foe, he should have neither judge nor jury, but guilty death without any more ado. <laughs> now, Lord Stanley, what news? Have you received any letters of your late embassage into Brittany? What answer have you received of your letters? Why, my lord, for that I sent, I have received. And how doth your son, then? Is he in health? Uh, for his health, my lord, I do not mistrust. Pray, tell us when he means to arrive in England, and how many of our nobility is with him, and what power is with him. And please, your grace, his power is unknown to me, nor willingly would not I be privy to such causes. Oh, good words, Lord Stanley. But give me leave to glean out of your golden field of eloquence how brave you plead ignorance, as though you knew not of your son's departure into Brittany out of England. Not I, my lord. Why, is not his mother thy wife? And dares he pass over without the blessing of his mother, whose husband thou art? I desire, Your Majesty, give me leave to speak. Oh, yes, speak, Stanley. No doubt some finely coloured tale. And like Your Grace, whereas you mistrust that I knew of my son's departure out of England and to Brittany, God I take to record it was unknown to me nor know not yet what his pretense is. For at his departure was I one of the Privy Council to your brother, King Edward the Fourth, and that she was able to relieve him without my help. I hope her sufficiency is known to your grace. Therefore, I humbly crave pardon. Well, Stanley, I fear it will be proven to the contrary that thou didst furnish him both with money and munition, which if it be, then look for no favour at my hands, but the due deserts of a traitor. But <laughs> let this pass. What's your repair to our presence? Only this, my lord, that I may repair from the court to my house in the country. I, sir, that you might be in Cheshire and Lancashire. Then should your posts pass invisible into Brittany and you to depart the realm at your pleasure, or else I suffer an intolerable foe under me, which I will not. But Stanley, to be brief, thou shalt not go. And so be done. Richard, I think that it were better to be alone than to have noisome company. He shall go, leaving for his loyalty a sufficient pledge Come hither, Stanley, thou shalt go, leaving me here thy son and heir, George Stanley, for a pledge that he may perish for thy fault, if need should be. Thou like is this, go. If not, answer me briefly and say quickly, no. I am to advise myself upon a secret cause and of a matter that concerns me near. Say that I leave my son unto the king, and that I should but aid... Earl Richmond, my son George Stanley dies. If my faith be kept unto my prince, George Stanley lives. Well, I will accept the king's proffer. And please your grace, I am content. I will leave my son to pledge. Here, come hither. And with thee, take this lesson. Thou art set free for our defence. Thou shalt upon thy pledge make this promise, not only to stay the hindrance of the Earl, but to prevent his purpose with thy power. Thou shalt not seek by any means to aid or rescue him. This done, of my life thy son doth live. 
but otherwise thy son dies, and thou too if I catch thee. And it shall go hard, but I will catch thee. And you shall go apace, and yet go without me. I humbly take my leave of your grace. Farewell, George. How do I know? What do you give him? Letters? No, my lord. I've done. The second sight is sweet of such a son. Carry George Stanley to prison. Alas, my lord, shall I go to prison? Shall you go to prison? Well, it questions that. So prick to the lamb and wound the dam. <laughs> How likest thou this, Catesby? Oh, my lord, uh, so excellent that you have imprisoned his son. <laughs> Nay. Now will we look to the rest. I sent the Lord Lovell to the Mother Queen concerning my suit to her daughter Elizabeth. Uh, ah, let's see, in good time, here he is. <laughs> How now, Lovell, what news? What saith the Mother Queen to my suit? My Lord, she, very strange she was at the first, but when I had told her the cause, she gave consent, desiring your majesty to make the nobility privy to it. God have mercy. Lovell, but... What said Lady Elizabeth? Why, my lord, strange, as women will be at the first, but through entreaty of her mother, she quickly gave consent. And the queen willed me to tell your grace that she means to leave sanctuary and come to the court with all her daughters. Aye, marry Lovell, let not that opportunity slip. Look to it, Catesby. Be careful for it, Lovell, for thereby hangs such a chance that may enrich us and our heirs forever. But, but, sirs, heard ye nothing of the Scottish nobles that met at Nottingham to confer about the marriage of my niece? Not a word, my lord. God's wounds! Who's that? Search the villain. Has he any dags about him? No, my lord, I have none. From whence comes thou? From the peers at Nottingham and Scotland, and they greet your majesty. Sirrah, is the ma marriage concluded between the Scottish Earl and the fair Lady Rosa? Prithee, tell us, is it concluded? How sayst thou, is it concluded? Nay, will you give me leave to tell you that? <laughs> Why, you, you villains, will you know the secret of my letter by, by interrupting messengers that are sent to me? Away! I say, be gone! It is time to look about. Away! I say. But here yet, villains! My lord! I have somewhat to say besides. Then speak it. What hast thou to say? This, my lord. When the peers of England and Scotland met at Nottingham together to confer about the marriage of your niece, it was straight determined that she should be married with the Scottish Earl. And further, my lord, the council commanded me to deliver unto your grace the treasons of Captain Blunt, who had the Earl of Oxford in charge at Ham's Castle. Now they are both fed, and purposes to aid the Earl of Richmond against your grace. Now, my lord, I take my leave. Messenger, stay! Hath Blunt betrayed? Hath Oxford rebel, and egged the Earl of Richmond? May this be true. <laughs> what is our prison so weak, our friends so fickle? Our port so ill luck to that they may pass and repass the seas at their pleasure. Every one conspires, spoils our conflex, conquers our castles, and arms themselves with their own weapons unresisted. Oh, villains, rebels, fugitives, thieves! How we are betrayed when our own swords shall beat us and our own subjects. Seek the subversion of the state, the fall of their prince, and sack of their country of his. Nay, neither must nor shall, for I will arm me with my friends and cut off my enemies and beard them to their face that dares me. And but one, I, one, in the seas that try. His power is weak, and we are strong. 
therefore I will meet him with such melody that the singing of a bullet shall send him merrily to his longest home. Come, follow me. Welcome, dear friends and loving countrymen. Welcome, I say, to England's blissful isle, whose forwardness I cannot but commend that thus do aid us in our enterprise. My right it is, and sole inheritance, and Richard but usurps in my authority, for in his tyranny he slaughtered those that would not succour him in his attempt, whose guiltless blood craves daily at God's hands revenge for outrage done to their harmless lives. And then courage, countrymen, and never be dismayed. Our quarrel's good, and God will help the right, for we may know by dangers we have passed that God, no doubt, will give us victory. If love of gold or four many foes could not have daunted us in our attempts, thy foot had never touched the English shore, and here O Oxford fights his faith to thee, never to leave in what we have undertaken, but follow still with resolution, for thou be crowned as conqueror in the field, or lose thy life in following of thy right. Thy right, brave Richmond, which we will maintain, more than the hardest bird of Richard's brood, then cousin Richmond being resolved thus, let us speak to arms, and God and St. George for us. As this brave earl have said, so say we all. We will not leave thee till the field be won, which, if with fortunate success we can perform, think then, Earl Richmond, that I follow thee, and that shall be honour enough for me. So saith Landites, that honours Richmond so, with love unfeigned for his valour past, that if your honour lead the way to death, Peter Landois hath sworn to follow thee. For if the Queen Mother do but keep her word, and what appears her promise be performed, touching the marriage with Elizabeth, daughter to our King, Edward IV, and by this marriage join in unity those famous houses, Lancashire and York, then England shall no doubt have cause to say Edward's coronation was a joyful day. And tis all that Landois desires to see. Thanks, Landois. And hear Earl Richmond's vows. If their kind promises take but effect that, as they have promised, I be made king, I will so deal in governing the state which now lies like a savage sheltered grove where brambles, briars and thorns o'ergrow these sprigs, which if they might but spring to their effect and not be crossed so by their contraries, making them subject to these outrages, would prove such members of the commonweal that England should in them be honoured as much as ever was the Roman state when it was governed with, by the consul's rule. And I will draw my sword, brave countrymen, and never leave to follow my resolve till I have mown those brambles, briars, and thorns that hinder those that belong to us. Why, we have faced the dangerous branch of all, which was his garrison at Milford Haven. Shall we dismay or daunt our friends to come, because he took the Duke of Buckingham? No worthy friends, and nothing countrymen. Oxford did never bear so base a mind. He will not wink at murders secretly put up, nor suffer upstarts to enjoy our rights, nor live in England under an usurping king. And this is Oxford's resolution. But, but Blunt, look who's that knocks. My lord, tis a messenger from the Mother Queen, and uh, the Lady Stanley, your mother, with letters. I admit him straight. Now shall we hear some news? I, long live Earl Richmond, the, 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 the Mother Queen doth uh, greet your honour. Oh, welcome, my friend. How fares our mother and in, the rest? In health, uh, my lord, and glad to hear of your arrival safe. Huh. My friend. My mother 
has written to me of certain that are coming in our aid, the report of whose names are referred to thee to the liver. First, there's the Lord Talbot, the Earl of Shrewsbury's son and heir with a brave band of his own. There is also the, the Lord Fitzherbert, the Earl of Pembroke's son and heir. Of the gentlemen of the Welsh, there is Rhys up Thomas and Sir Thomas up Richard and Sir Owen Williams, brave gentlemen, my lord. The, the, these are the chief. Now, these the full number of all that come. Uh, only two more, my lord, which I have left unnamed. The the one is uh, Sir, Sir Thomas Dennis, a Western gentleman, and joined with him one Arnold, Arnold Butler. A great many are willing, but there is not as yet. Does Arnold Butler come? I can hardly brook his treachery, for if he, for he it was that wrought my disgrace with thee. Well, my lord, we are now to strengthen ourselves with friends and not to reap our old quarrels. Say that Arnold Butler did injure you in the time of peace. The man is twice made if he stand with you in the time of wars. Well, my friend, take this for thy good news and commend me to your mother, to our mother and the rest. Thus, my lords, you see, God still provides for us. But now, my lords, uh, touching the placing of our battle best and how we may be least endangered, because I will be foremost in this fight to encounter with that bloody murderer. Myself will lead the forward of our troops. Uh, my lord of Oxford, you as our second self shall have the happy leading of the rear, a place I know which you will well deserve. And uh, Captain Blunt, Peter Landois, and you shall be uh, in quarters as our battle's scouts, provided thus your bowmen, Captain Blunt, must uh, scatter here and there to gall their horse. As also, when that our promised friends do come, then must you hold hard skirmish with our foes, till I, by cast of a countermarch, have joined our power with those that come to us, then casting close as wings on either side, we will give a new bravado on the foe. Therefore, let us towards Atherstone Main, where we this night, God willing, will encamp. <laughs> From thence towards Lichfield, we will march next day, and nearer London, bid King Richard play. Where shall I find a place to sigh my fill? and wail the grief of our sore troubled king. For now he hath obtained the diadem, but with such great discomfort to his mind that he had better lived a private man. His looks are ghastly, hideous to behold, and from the privy center of his heart there comes such deep fetched sighs and fearful cries that being with him in his chamber oft he moves me weep and sigh for company. For if he hear one stir, he riseth up and claps his hand upon his dagger straight, ready to stab him whatsoe'er he be. But he must think this is the just revenge that heavens have poured upon him for his sins. Those peers which he unkindly murdered do cry for justice at the hands of God. And he in justice sends continual fear for to affright him both at bed and board. But stay, what noise is this? Who have we here? How now, sirs? Whither are you going so fast? Why, to Earl Richmond's camp to serve with him, for we have left to serve King Richard now. Uh, what? Comes there any more? A number more. Why, these are the villains my lord would have put his life into their hands. Richard, now do my eyes witness that thy end is at hand. For thy commons make no more account of thee than of a private man. Yet will I, as duty binds, give thee advertisements of their unjust proceedings. My master hath lifted out many, yet hath left one to lift him out of all, not only of his crown, but also of his life. <sighs> well, I will in 
to tell my lord of what has happened. Uh, good my lord, depart and leave me to myself. Pray, my lord, let me go along with you. My lord, it may not be, for I have promised my father that none shall come but myself. Therefore, good my lord, depart. My lord, have a care for yourself. I like not these night walks and starting abroad in the evening so disguised. For you must not, now that you are in the usurper's dominions, and you are the only mark he aims at, and your last night's absence but such a amazement in our soldiers that they, like men wanting the power to follow arms, were on a sudden more likely to fly than to fight. Therefore, good my lord, if I may not stand near, let me stand aloof off. Contend thee, good Oxford, and though I confess myself bound to thee for thy especial care, yet at this time, pray thee hold me excused. But farewell, good, my lord. Here comes my lord and father. Captain, I pray thee, bring me word when thou dost describe the enemy. Farewell, leave me for a while. How fares my gracious lord and father? In good health, my son. The better to see thee thus forward in this laudable enterprise. But omitting vain circumstances, come briefly to the purpose. I am now in few words to deliver much matter, for know this. When I came to crave leave of the king to depart from the court, the king very furiously began to charge me that I was both acquainted with thy practices and drifts, and that I knew of thy landing, and by no means would grant me leave to go till as pledge of my loyalty and true dealing with the king, I should leave my young son, George Stanley. Thus I have left my son in the hands of a tyrant, only of purpose to come and speak with thee. But omitting this, I prithee tell me, shall I look for your help in the battle? I cannot. As I will not go to the usurper, no more I will not come to thee. Why, then it is bootless for us to stay, for all we presumed upon was on your aid. Son, George Stanley's death. Do you no pleasure? Time is so troublesome for him to tend to follow execution. <laughs> Tyrants expect no time. George Stanley being young and a gristle is the more easy to be made away. This news goes to my heart, but it is in vain for me to look for victory when with a molehill we shall encounter. Son, see how contrary you are, I assure you. The chiefest of his company are liker to fly than thee than to fight against thee. For me, think me not so simple. I can at my pleasure fly to thee, or being with them, fight faintly that the battle shall be won on thy part with um, small encountering. Not this besides, the king is now come to Leicester and means tomorrow to bid thee battle in Bosworth. Come, my lord, I do descry the enemy. My son, farewell, I can stay no longer. Yet, good father, one word more ere you depart. What number do you think the king's power to be? Mary, 20,000. So for well. But and we hardly five thousand being beset with many enemies, hoping upon a few friends, yet despair not, Richmond. But remember, thou fightest in right to defend thy country from the tyranny of an usurping tyrant. Therefore, Richmond, go forward. The more dangerous the battle is in attaining, it proves the more honourable being obtained. Then forward, Richmond. God and Saint George for me. Quisquam regno gaudit, o oh, falax bonum. The hell of life that hangs upon the crown, the daily cares, the nightly dreams, the wretched crews, the treason of the foe, and the horror of my bloody practice past, who strikes such a terror to my wounded conscience that sleep I wake I or whatsoe'er I do me thinks there are ghosts come gaping for revenge whom I have slain in reaching for a crown. Clarence complains and crieth for revenge. My nephew's blood's revenge, revenge, not 
cry. The headless peers come pressing for revenge and everyone cries, let the tyrant die. The, the, the sun by day shines hotly for revenge. The moon by night eclipses for revenge. The stars are turned to comets for revenge. The planets change their courses for revenge. The birds sing not but sorrow for revenge. The silly lamb sits bleeding for revenge. The, the shrieking raven sits croaking for revenge. Oh, the birds of beasts come bellowing for revenge. And all, in all the world, I think, cries for revenge. Nothing but revenge. In company, I dare not trust my friend. He's alone. I dread a secret foe. I doubt my food, lest poison lurk therein. My bed is uncouth. Rest refrains my head. <laughs> then such a life I count far worse to be than thousand deaths unto a damned death. How was death? I said. Who dare attempt death? <laughs> Nay! Who dare so much as once think my death? Enemies there be that would my body kill, yet shall they leave a never dying mind. <laughs> but you villains, rebels, traitors as you are, how came the foe in pressing so near? left the garrison that should have beat them back. Where was our friends to intercept the foe? Oh, God! My friend! His loyalty quite laid abed. <laughs> then, vengeance, mischief, horror with mischance, wildfire with whirlwinds, light upon your heads! that thus betrayed your prince by your untruth. <laughs> A frantic man, what means thou by this mood? Now he has come once more, need to beat him back. Uh, sour is his sweet that favors thy delight, great is his power that threats thy overthrow. The bad rebellion of my foe is not so much for us to see my friends do fly in flocks. May, may it please your grace to rest yourself content, for uh, you have enough power to defend your land. Dares Richmond to set his foot on land with such a small power of straggling fugitives? May it please your grace to participate the cause that thus doth trouble you? The cause, buzzard! What cause should I participate to thee? My friends are gone away and fled from me. Keep silence, villain. Wist I by post do send thy soul to hell. Not one word more if thou dost love thy life. Uh, my lord? Yet again, villain! <laughs> oh, Catesby. Now. What? Comes the Lord Stanley or no? Uh, my lord, he answers no. I did not tell him then I would send his George, his son George Stanley's head to him. Uh, my lord, I did so, and he answered, he had another son left to make Lord Stanley. <sighs> Villain, vile, and breaker of his oath. The bastard's ghost shall haunt him at the heels and cry revenge for his vile father's wrongs. Go, Lovell, Gatesby, fetch George Stanley forth. Him, with these hands, will I butcher for the dead and send his headless body to his sire. Uh, leave off executions. Now the foe is here that threatens us most cruelly of our lives. Zones, foe me no foes. The father's fact condemns the son to die. Uh, but guiltless blood will for revengement cry. Why? Was he not left for his father's loyalty? 
therein his father greatly injured him. Did not yourselves in presence see the bonds sealed and assigned? What the, my lord, the, the Vard its own, the titles doth resign. The bond is broke and I will sue the fine, except you will hinder me. Hmm? What, will you have it so? Uh, in doing true justice, else we answer no. His treacherous father hath neglect his word and done impartial past by dint of sword. Therefore, sirrah, go fetch him. Zones, draw you cocks who shall go. I bid you go, Catesby. Richard, now mayest thou see thy end at hand. Why, sirs? Why fear you thus? Why? We are ten to one. If you seek promotion, I am a king already in possession, better able to perform than he. Of all, Catesby, let's join lovingly and devoutly together, and I will divide my whole kingdom amongst you. We will, we will my, my lord. Ah, oh, Catesby, thou lookest like a dog, and thou Lovell too. But you will run away with them that be gone, and the devil go with you all! God, I hope, God, what talk I of God that have served the devil all this while. No, fortune and courage for me, and join England against me with England, join Europe with Europe, come Christendom, and with Christendom, the whole world, and yet I will never yield, but by death only. By death, no die, part not childishly from thy crown, but come the devil to claim it. Strike him down, and though that fortune hath decreed to set revenge with triumphs on my wretched head, yet death, sweet death, my latest friend hath sworn to make a bargain for my lasting fame. And this, I this very day, I hope with this lame hand of mine to rake out the hateful heart of Richmond. And when I have it, to eat it panting hot with salt and drink his blood lukewarm. Well, I'd be sure to poison me. Sirs, you that be resolute, Follow me. Rest. Go hang yourselves. receive my body cold and void of sense. You watery heavens roll on my gloomy day and darksome clouds close up my cheerful sound. Down is thy son, Richard. Mine again. The birds whose feathers should adorn thy head hovers aloft and dares not come in sight. Yet faint not, man, for this day, if Fortune will shall make thee king possessed with quiet crown. If fates deny, this crown must be my grave. Yet golden thoughts that reached for a crown, daunted before by fortune's cruel spite, are come as comforts to my drooping heart and bids me keep my crown and die a king. These are my last. What more I have to say, I'll make report among the damned souls. How my 
today I know the certain true report of this victorious battle fought today. My friend, whatever thou beest, tell me the true report. Which part hath won the victory, whether the king or no? Ah, uh, no, the king is slain, and he hath lost the day. And Richmond, he hath won the field and triumphs like a valiant conqueror. Ah, uh, but who is slain uh, besides our lord and sovereign? Um, slain is the worthy Duke of Norfolk, he, and with him, Sir Robert Brackenbury, lieutenant of the tower. Besides Lovell, he made also a partner in this tragedy. But w where is Sir William Catesby? He is this day beheaded on a stage at Leicester because he took part with my lord the king. But stay, stay, report, and thou shalt hear me tell the brief discourse and how the battle fell. Then no report that Richard came to field mounted on horseback with as high resolve as fierce Achilles amongst the sturdy Greeks whom to encounter worthy Richmond came, accompanied with many followers, and then my lord displayed his colors straight and with the charge of trumpet, drum, and fife, those brave battalions straight encounter it. But in the skirmish, which continued long, my lord gan faint, which Richmond straight perceived and presently did sound a fresh alarm, but Worthy Richard, that did never fly, but followed honor to the gates of death, straight spurred his horse to encounter with the Earl, in which encounter Richmond did prevail. Taking Richard at advantage then, he threw his horse and him both to the ground. There was worthy Richard wounded so that afterwards he ne'er recovered strength. But to be brief, my master would not yield, but with his loss of life, he lost the field. Report, farewell. Now, noble peers and worthy countrymen, since God hath given us fortune of the day, let us first give thanks unto his deity. And next, with honours fitting your deserts, I must be grateful to my countrymen and worthy Oxford for thy service showed in hot encountering of the enemy. Earl Richmond binds himself in lasting bonds of faithful love and perfect unity. Sorry I am for those that I have lost by our so dangerous encountering with the foe, but sorrow cannot bring the, death, the dead to life and therefore are my sorrows spent in vain. Only to those that live, thus much I say, I will maintain them with a manual pay. And loving father, lastly, to yourself, though not the least in our expected aid, we give most thanks for your unlooked for aid. Then we have power on sudden to declare. But for your thanks, I hope it shall suffice that I in nature love and honour you. Well spoken, son, like a man of worth, whose resolution in this battle past hath made thee famous amongst thy enemies. And think, my son, I glory more to hear what praise the common people gave of thee, than if the peers by general full consent had set me down to wear the diadem. And live, my son, thus loved of thy friends, and for thy foes, Prepare to combat them. And Oxford vows perpetual love to thee, wishing as many honours to Earl Richmond as Caesar had in conquering the world. And I doubt not, but if fair fortune follow thee, to see thee honoured amongst thy countrymen, as Hector was among the lords of Troy, or Tully amongst the Roman senators. How fair is our lovely mother queen? In health, Earl Richmond, glad to hear the news that God hath given thee fortune of the day. But tell me, lords, where is my son, Lord Marcus Dorset, that he's not here? 
What? Was he murdered in this tragedy? Oh, no, lovely queen, your son doth live in France, for being distressed and driven by force of tempest to that shore, and many of our men being sick and dead, we were enforced to ask the king for aid, as well for men as for munitions, which then the king did willingly supply, provided that as hostage for those men, Lord Marquis Dorset should be privileged with them, should be pledged with them. But, madam, now our troubled war is done, Lord Marcus Dorset shall come home again. <laughs> Richmond, gramercy for thy kind good news, which is not little comfort to thy friends, to see how God hath been thy happy guide in this late conquest of our enemies. And, Richmond, as thou art returned with victory, so we will keep our words effectually. Then, madam, for our happy battle's victory, first, thanks to heaven, next, to my forward countrymen. But, madam, pardon me, though I make bold to charge you with a promise that you made, which was confirmed by divers of the peers, touching the marriage of Elizabeth, and having ended what I promised you, madam, I look and hope to have my due. Then, no, my son, the peers, by full consent, in that thou hast freed them from a tyrant's yoke, have by election chosen thee as king. First, in regard, they account thee virtuous. Next, for that they hope all foreign broils shall cease, and that thou wilt guide and govern them in peace. And sit down, my son. And here receive the crown of England as thy proper own. Henry the Seventh, by the grace of God, King of England, France, and Lord of Ireland, God save the King. Long live Henry the Seventh, King of England. England. <laughs> Thanks loving friends and my kind countrymen and here i vow in presence of you all to root abuses from this commonwealth which now flows faster than the furious tide that overflows beyond the banks of nile and loving father and my other friends whose ready forwardness hath made me fortunate richmond will still in honorable love count himself to be at your dispose nor do I wish to enjoy a longer life than I shall live to think upon your love. But what saith Eliz fair Elizabeth to us? For now we have well welcomed your other friends. I must uh, bid you welcome, lady, among the rest, and in my welcome crave to be resolved how you resolve touching my proffered love to, unto you. Here our mother and the peers agree, and all is ended if you condescend. Then know, my lord, that if my mother please, I must in duty yield to her command. For when our aged father left this life, he willed us honor still our mother's age. And therefore, as my duty doth command, I do commit myself to her dispose. Then here, my lord, receive thy royal spouse. Virtuous Elizabeth, for both the peers and commons do agree that this fair princess shall be wife to thee. And we pray all that fair Elizabeth may live for I and never yield to death. And so say I. Thank you. Thanks to you all, my lords, that thus have honoured Richmond with a crown. And if I live, then make account, my lords, I will deserve this with more than common love. And now we put my son, George Stanley, here. How happy were our present meeting then, but he is dead. Nor shall I ever more see my sweet boy, whom I do love so dear. Well, I know the usurper in his rage hath made a slaughter of my aged joy take comfort gentle father 
for I hope my brother George will turn in safe to us. <laughs> my son, he that joys in blood will work his fury on the innocent. <laughs> Anna, what noise is this? Behold, Lord Stanley, we bring thy son, thy son, George Stanley, whom with great danger we have saved from fury of a tyrant's doom. Lives George Stanley, then happy that I am to see him freed thus from a tyrant's rage. Welcome, my son, my sweet George. Welcome home. Oh, thanks, my good father. And George Stanley joys to see you joined in this assembly. And like a lamb kept by a greedy wolf within the enclosed center of the earth, expecting death without delivery, even from this danger is George Stanley come to be a guest of Richmond, mm, hey? <laughs> and all the rest. For when the bloody butcher heard your honour did refuse to come to him, he, like a savage tiger, then enraged, commanded straight I should be murdered, and sent these two to execute the deed. But they, that knew how innocent I was, did post him off with many long delays, alleging reasons to allay his rage. But twas in vain for he, like to a starved lioness, still called for blood, saying that I should die. But to be brief, when both the battles joined, these two and others shifted me away. Now seeing that each thing turns to our content, I will it be proclaimed presently that traitorous Richard be by our command drawn through the streets of Leicester, stark naked, on a collier's horse let him be laid, for as of others' pains he had no regard, so let him have a traitor's due reward. Now, for our marriage and our nuptial rites, our pleasure is they be solemnized in our Abbey of Westminster, according to the ancient custom due, the two and twentieth day of August next. Set forwards then, my lords, towards London straight, there to take further order for the state. Thus, gentles, may you here behold the joining of these houses both in one by this brave prince, Henry the Seventh who was for wit compared to Solomon. His government was virtuous in every way, and God did wondrously increase his store. Um, he did subdue a proud rebellious lord that did encounter him upon Blackheath. Uh, he died when he had reigned full three and 20 years, eight months and some odd days, and lies buried in Westminster. He, he died and left behind a son. A son he left, a Harry of that name, a worthy, valiant, and victorious prince. For on the fifth year of his happy reign, he entered France, and to the Frenchman's costs, he won Turwin and Turney. The emperor served this king for common pay, and as a mercenary prince did follow him. Then, after Maul and Mauls conquered he, still did keep the Frenchman at a bay, and lastly, in this king's decreasing age, he conquered Bullen, and after, when he was turned home, he died, when he had reigned full 38 years, nine months, and some odd days, and was buried in Windsor. He died and left three famous sprigs behind him. Edward VI, he did restore the gospel to his light, and finished that his father left undone, a wise young prince, given greatly to his book. He brought the English service first in use, and died when he had reigned six years, five months, and some odd days, and lieth buried in Westminster. Next after him, a Mary did succeed, which married Philip, King of Spain. She reigned five years, four months, and some odd days, and is buried in Westminster. She, when she was dead, her sister did succeed. 
Worthy Elizabeth, a mirror in her age by whose wise life and civil government her country was defended from the cruelty of famine, fire and sword, war's fearful messengers. This is that queen, as writers truly say that God had marked down to live for I. Then happy England amongst thy neighbour isles, for peace and plenty still attends on thee, and all the favourable planet smiles to see thee live in such prosperity. She is that lamp that keeps fair England's light, and through her faith her country lives in peace. And she hath put proud Antichrist to flight, and been the means that civil wars did cease. Then England, Kneel upon thy hairy knee and thank that God that still provides for thee. The Turk admires to hear her government, and babies in jury sound her princely name. All Christian princes to that prince hath sent, after her rule was rumoured forth by fame. The Turk hath sworn never to lift his hand to wrong the princess of this blessed land. T'were vain to tell the care this queen hath had in helping those that were oppressed by war, and how her majesty hath still been glad when she hath heard of peace proclaimed from far. Geneva, France, and Flanders hath set down the good she hath done since she came to the crown, for which if e'er her life be taken away, God grant her soul may live in heaven for a, for if her grace's days be brought to end, your hope is gone. On whom did peace depend? And lo, yes, that's the end of the play on that uh, cheerful note of uh, of how great the Queen is. Um, Something that hasn't dated in any way whatsoever. Welcome everyone back into the room. Well done, everyone. There was some really, really nice stuff in there. I mean, we talk about these sessions being primarily about um, uh, giving us a chance to, you know, give an idea of the play, give a sense of how it flows, how it how it runs. Um, but you know, some, sometimes it just flies, doesn't it? Some, um, I, what I really, really love about this is actually the narrative drive to this play. I mean, it, we, we, I put a completely artificial interval in. I wouldn't have put the inter an interval in where we stopped between these two sessions. But there isn't really anywhere to put a satisfac a fully satisfactory interval in because it just keeps on moving. Um, there is no uh, now let's there's a bit of a time to get your breath because it just keeps going and it's that sense of yesterday you know the beginning takes a while to get into it but once that narrative just gets going there is no stopping it uh, even when there are quite long scenes that are doing really I mean I have to say Catesby Catesby, the, 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 uh, a part I, I don't think we necessarily latched on to as much last time. But yeah, P Catesby, one of a long line of people trying to manage Richard, and does really badly. <laughs> uh, really came out, I really liked that. Um, and, and yeah, just so many things. And actually, I think the first time around, I, I hadn't really, I'd taken on board that there were some really nice elements to King Richard himself. Um, yeah, there were some nice set pieces, but I hadn't actually got a sense of that 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 flow and progression and and the journey. You get much more in this second half, second you know, four 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 sevenths or however we want to call it. Um, that that works really well. It's it's a real shame we weren't able to run it all the way through in one go because yeah, it it really really works very nicely. Um, Thoughts from the room. We've got a few minutes uh, for um, any anything about you know what what we uh, you know going forward in terms of uh, heading towards full productions of this. Um, things you really loved, uh, things to a degree you perhaps didn't love, uh, without obviously being mean about people's performances. Uh, Lynn, then Elizabeth, then Eric. I feel that the one part of the the story, the narrative that does drag a little is the kind of extended coda after Richard's death. 
I feel like it takes a little too long to wrap things up. And it's nice that, oh, we think George is dead, but he's alive. And uh, let's, let's tie up all the loose ends and I'm going to be a great king and rule with consent and all of that. But it, it takes a little too long, I think. Uh, it, it, it kind of buggers up the pace, which is, as you say, you know, really quite brisk up to then. There's something to keep in mind is like, it's over. It does, you know, the, the, the audience might um, lose patience with that bit a little bit. Yeah, I mean, it's a bit, uh, you know, the qu Queen comes in and goes, um, how's Dorset? And we're all going, oh, hey. that was in scene two, right? Um, and, and I'm just going, no, we don't need that. I actually quite liked George when he comes in and that speech. I thought um, actually Sarah's take on that was really nice because he just comes across as just actually slightly wrong tone <laughs> <laughs> and it breaks up the solemnity uh, a bit but yeah i feel trims there and definitely that last bit of propagandizing at the end uh you know we don't have that queen anymore uh it it, it it's it's yeah things uh elizabeth and eric yeah, I thought there was like a tremendous smoothness to this like this reiteration of the play compared to the last time we did it. I thought there was a tremendous amount of flow and there was a scene I absolutely loved between Alexandra and Aliki where they were doing a battle on stage and they killed one another and it was so good. It was incredibly good. And I kept missing my lines because I was so busy in trance listening to other people speak. So I thought to it was a stellar, stellar performance. I really enjoyed it. Yeah, I, I, you know, backstage, as it were, for a lot of us on chat, we're just going, yeah, really, yeah, really into this. Uh, really, in a, in a, once I say, yeah, it's that driver, Eric. Uh, yeah, no, I was just going to say that I think there were some points where there were exits and entrances that were a bit weird. Like, um, for example, my scene with the leaky at some point was kind of like, I think this is meant to be a monologue, uh, you know, with uh, King Richard and Lovell. And then, uh, and then level enters. That would make more sense. But anyway, um, uh, yeah, no, I, I loved watching <laughs> what, what I had a chance to watch, and it was just. Um, I, I also see why you have trouble with the interval because, right after scene eleven, when the next time we saw Richard, he's a completely different person. Suddenly, racked by guilt and stuff, compared to before, um, where he's just like, "Yes, I'm gonna get the crown." And then, as soon as he gets the crown, it's like sort of a change of heart kind of mm. i mean in, yeah, in, downhill in all the way yeah i mean in terms of balancing i, I just feel that the, that that the jane shaw could could coincide with a sort of uh, coronation procession by king richard giving us a sort of way to end the act or end the half and then we're it straight into uh, paranoia and child murder and uh, I think that's the best compromise I was sort of listening as we were going along going maybe hit no that's not an ending that's not a beginning and you know it's one of those problems for a modern theatre you know uh, I'm, I'm a big non-fan of straight through things unless the theatre is really well designed for people to just leave and get up whenever they like because uh, um, yeah some people cannot sit through three hours of drama without uh, getting up like most people um, and some people really, really can't. So, I, uh, you know, finding a good interval is a really important challenge for us, or, or more than one. I don't think this is a two-interval job because it's not that long a play. Um, other thoughts? Um, I've, you may have to wa wave expansively because everyone's so small. Um, <laughs> everyone's tiny. Lois. Yeah, well, I'd agree with your idea about the interval. I think it should come after the, the first scene we did this time. That is the, the big Jane Shore scene, uh, which was about, about the only scene I was able to kind of watch all the way through because I was so nervous about missing entrances and exits that I'll have to see most of this later. But I, I thought that scene was wonderful. And so, uh, I mean, it, but it also is, is so moving that it makes a kind of transition to the darker tone, that, you know, the next time we see Richard. Mm. Uh, other thoughts um, at this end of the week, uh, Alexandra. Um, going back to a point that we brought into discussion yesterday about um, asides and who is speaking to whom, and um, there are lots of things that that we can't do on Zoom because of the nature of the medium that uh, in, a, in a staged production would be conveyed very easily through proximity, through who is standing beside whom and, and speaking to whom, and also um, uh, through motion. 
because I think there's a lot of characters like Dorset who are relevant historical people, but we no longer have those um, immediate kind of markers. It's not like you say, I don't know Yoda, and I immediately know who you're talking about, you know. Um, so we would need, in a, in a full production, I think it would be really important to, to make these characters all kind of clearly individually identifiable and then spend some attention on that aspect, which we couldn't do. Um, and I think that will add an extra layer of the factionalism and the, the, the um, back and forth and the infighting and the uh, things like, you know, Buckingham betraying, supposedly betraying Richard. Um, for example, by changing sides, essentially. He's not the only one that does it. He's just the person that comes to mind. Yeah, uh, that's really important. Again, it's saying that that split uh, between two sessions uh, adds is, you know, we forget that that factionalism has always been there. Richard did not invent the factionalism. It was already embedded. And actually what's important about Richmond is that he's able to bring people together. And I really liked the character of Richmond uh, mm. today. You know, I genuinely thought that this wasn't some cardboard cutout who's come here to just save the save the day. Um, and I really love the way that scene with Stanley works because again with Stanley it's not like oh what do I do it's it's some plot point thrown at the audience it's a real dilemma for Stanley that is talked out between two different antagonists between Richard and Richmond and I think that's dramatically really clever and really nicely done uh, Alexandra again and also between two different kinds of sons. One is his biological son and heir, and the other one is, you know, potentially the king, but it's his adoptive son. So you've got that internal tearing between whom whom, whom do I support and which one do I let die, which is horrible. Mm. Stephen? Well, just to add to that, the final scene, uh, he calls Richard with his son three times. He doesn't know if his other son's alive yet. Mm. So it really comes to a head in that in that coronation scene. Mm. Uh, Eric, I was going to say that uh, there was a part where because because we you know finished off uh, Tancred and you know all that stuff last night, uh, Lucrece and so on and so forth, Gismund, uh, Gismunda. Uh, there was because of that, my my brain just went, oh, I think you should totally do like Gismund, the whole like Tancred speech just because of uh, the the description you know with the eat his heart so and you know pepper it with salt and all that stuff and it was just because of the proximity of the place time wise it just you know it made sense yes eric is referring to a a, a senecan student tragedy of of intense um uh tarantino-ness um and, uh, yeah <laughs> it's interesting actually yeah how the um the way Richard uh, deals with people. I mean, I just love the way the ser he keeps telling his servants to go and they don't. <laughs> uh, and, you know, sometimes maybe they did. I was putting lots of question marks whether maybe they, you know, how that works and the dynamics of power going on there. Uh, Lois. Yeah, that was what I was wondering about. Um, I, I'm not sure if we got it right or not because I wasn't watching anybody else except in the thumbnails and in, in that scene of uh, Catesby Lovell and Richard about killing off George Stanley. But it seemed to me that was one that could have done with rehearsal, actually, to decide whether we were both going to behave the same or differently. But we are actually disobeying him in that scene. And mm -hmm. I thought, I mean, it seems so unlike, unlike Catesby to disobey him for anything, but Lovell seemed to be much more independent. And he does come out with the um, relatively moral statements, even though he's working for Richard. So I think there's a whole dynamic we could have developed there, probably. I yeah, feared for my life. Yeah, that, that sense of the downfall uh, uh, arc as well of, you know, what do people do? Who's going to leave him? Who doesn't leave him? You know, you can see that Catesby and Lovell are going, how close to the exit can we get uh, <laughs> to a different degree? Uh, Lynn, then a leaky. Yeah, that, that um, this conversation brings to mind a, an interesting point. In the uh, first half, Richard has a really interesting speech about, I just want to be king for a year, a month a day just long enough so that people address me as king it's like it, 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 you almost hear him saying for once in my whole life i want people to respect me and to take me seriously i just want not to be invisible and a nobody and at the bottom of the dog pile and then when he becomes king he it, people don't actually treat him that 
reverently. So, I mean, I think you could play that that up, the 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 hope and the disappointment of that hope. Well, it's not only that; it's that it's his servants who lead the charge with calling him Majesty before he's gone too much mm-hmm. into that that thing. So the fact that they're the ones who are sort of saying, "Sir." Mm-hmm. And thing, you know, they're not being as 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 magisterish as they could be. Um, I think that's really interesting, Aliki. So I was thinking about what Alexandra said about Zoom and what you said, and I think Richard has a lot of scenes where he's on stage with other people, but he's talking to himself. And there's a great deal we can do with that proximity and that go away. Those go aways can be just further away from him physically. I mean, when a guy is pacing up and down and swearing and shouting, right, you're not going to be that close to him anyway, are you? Mm. Let's go over here and hope he doesn't notice. Well, also, it's that thing of uh, servants can't go that far away because they, you, you know, Richard's going to call them back again any second now to do something, and if they're not there in a in a, a, a click of the fingers, yeah. they're going to get severely um, deaded. There's something very nice about the the comical, tragic position that they're in, uh, which which we saw very much in Lois's Catesby. At least that's the one scene where I could really, because it was just the two of us, I was paying attention to other people's faces rather than the script, and that that energy and how that changes between richard and his servants will be a fascinating thing to look at in real space and it's a really good example of how a long speech isn't necessarily a long speech because you're talking to someone and these awkward pauses arise where the other person is trying to think of something to say um (laughs) what is the correct answer there is no correct answer no he's off again um and yeah it's um there's there's so much potential to still be played with um but is what I like. I, I, it would almost be unsatisfactory if it was just perfect and we came out the other side and you go, right, that's how we do it. Um, there's still so much more to dig. Uh, uh, sadly, um, unless anyone's bursting to say anything, I'm going to have to close the session. All that remains, I say all that remains, uh, at the end of this uh, this uh, really, really enjoyable uh, second look at this play is to say we will be coming back to this. That's the plan. We keep coming back to things. Uh, the next time we will be looking at this play across different media uh, will be uh, to a degree is that question of uh, what w- might we now uh, adjust with the text in terms of doing a modern production that's sort of the eff- uh, emphasis we might go uh, towards uh, we may not be doing that for a while um, but deciding uh, where we go with it next if you really like this play and you want to see us do more of it uh, get in touch uh, become a patron and just ha- just keep telling us how much you want us to do this play and you know because you know if you become a patron you're, you're giving us money and therefore giving us a budget to actually put on this play and uh, that's that's sort of how the system is supposed to work uh, all that remains is to thank all these wonderful people for all their wonderful performances today and goodbye bye bye